From New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, club and country driven by Continental Tire from the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios. I am Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer, Kaylin Carr, Charlie Davies, David Goss. Oh, we are live. If you're watching live and if you're on demand, well, then we're on demand. We're talking Gold Cup, of course. The final is set. U.S. Mexico. I almost said Canada. I almost slipped. I wanted to say Canada. I didn't get to say Canada, but U.S. Mexico Sunday, 8:30 p.m. Eastern on FS1. We're going to talk through all that. Uh, certainly, this insane match has just ended between uh, the upstarts, John Herdman's Canada, and the old guard in Mexico. And of course, the U.S. is one win against Qatar as well. And go through some big MLS news. Mark Anthony K. on the move. LAFC. To the Rapids, some big signings around the league, and of course your mail. But oh my God, did anybody drink some Cuban rum? That's the truth serum. Doyle drinks a little bit of that, goes to Mexico, and all of a sudden, all you a holes better watch out with your Matt Turner takes. How are you guys feeling tonight? <laughs> uh, awesome. I mean, uh, U.S. Mexico is what we wanted, right? I mean, uh, in a way, to get run that back. I mean, also Canada as well. That would have been amazing to see, and they were they ran away with like. The story of the night for sure was uh, Canada and just how impressive their performance was undermanned and all that. So, um, yeah, the game late on, uh, I mean, you got to feel for Canada right now because they put so much into it and the heartbreak of getting so close. But at the same time, you got to say they have so much to be proud about. How much more spice? Nations League final or this Canada-Mexico game? You oh, can't, man. you can't come close to the U.S. Mexico. You don't think you can't? You, <laughs> no, I mean, come no, on. No, absolutely not. Are You're you counting Canada out a little bit here, Charlie. No. You're showing your bias just a tad. Am I really though? When you're, were you talking about going down, coming back, going down, PKs, Christian Pulisic bangs it up for 90. They get a PK. Zach Steffen's out. Then Ethan Hor- Horvath comes in and makes an incredible save. I get it. Save. You're reliving. Oh, I'm trying to say. Well, you're reliving. I'm try. trying to say. You, this was an incredible match that we just incredible witnessed. Incredible match, but don't overhype. So, don't overhype. Okay, so I'm gonna ignore Charlie because Charlie's killing the buzz. Uh, <laughs> we did a real. We had a really fun pregame show on Twitter Spaces. We'll do it again on Sunday before the final. You can jump on. We asked questions, fan questions. Anders was on hosting, uh, and we talked about this game. And he was like, what do you want to see? What what do you need to happen? And the two main things that stood out to me was, I wanted Tejan to show he was one of the best players in this region and to show that he could play in Europe, that he could play with Mexican, you know, the top Mexican players, all that. That, done. That was an easy one that we got done. And I think over the course of this month, month and a half, has shown he is the big three for Canada. It's Alfonso Davies, Jonathan David, and Ustakio. And he hadn't played really in a true concacaf game. He had played Haiti on the road with no fans, but that's different. And he was in it today. And it wasn't his best game of the tournament, but he was able to battle. He was able to live, you know, amongst all the chaos in that midfield. And Osorio and Mark Anthony K stepped up next to him. I don't think there's anyone on this show right now who, if you asked them four hours ago and asked them now if Canada would qualify for a World Cup, would say the same thing. Whether you think they will now or not, You have to feel better about who this group is and how they can hang in this region than you did before tonight. Yeah, the the big thing for me was just also the the personality of the team. Like going, just being undermanned, not having a lot of their best players, a lot of reasons to make excuses, playing in Houston against an all Mexico crowd pretty much. I mean, it's like, you could have just, people were talking before the game about how many goals they would lose by. Um, And, the thing that I really liked and the, the way it was similar in some ways to the Nations League was um, just that fight, you know, that it really came down to. It, and it was probably it was more than that, too, because Canada also sought to play. They didn't just sit back um, and, and look to counter. They actually played. But um, the fight amongst all those guys, I thought, was they, they have definitely you could see the spirit within the squad um, to take it. And, you know, they had plenty of reasons to be able to say, like, 
I don't know, let's pack it in or not. But even like some of the CONCACAF stuff, they seemed up for that and didn't seem, you know, I think who was uh, Oso, uh, who was going over and getting in um, Salcedo's ear before the penalty. I mean, they showed real savvy throughout the match as well, too, that helped them um, get through at, at least until the late stages of the match. And um, that's why it was just so heartbreaking at the end. I mean, Pizarro does well coming in off the bench um, to be able to kind of like find that moment to Herrera, but. Uh, yeah, big big ups to Canada. So I'd say previously, a lot of the stuff that happens around penalty kicks is unnecessary and too much. But uh, I don't know if everyone saw this, but <laughs> there, there was someone who works in, as a sports psychologist and his thesis was about penalty kicks and the pressure and, and how players react. He interviewed a ton of players, I think, that played in Euros, Copa America, World Cup over like eight years. And he put together a ton of research that he put out during Euros and one of the things it said is every second it takes for a player to shoot, there's a higher chance they're going to miss. So from the whistle to shooting, the longer a player waits, the higher percentage they're going to miss. But from the moment the penalty gets awarded to the shot as well. And you saw it in Qatar, the Qatar-US game. I think Kellen Acosta loves this part of the game and has purely become an expert. Kamal Miller as well. He needed to go from one side of the arc to the other to be in front of some imaginary Mexico player that slowed Salcedo's shot just a little bit and made him wait and think about it a little bit longer, and both of them missed. So I, here I don't know how you rate. rotate PK takers. After Pineda did what he did on that first one and just doesn't – I don't know why you're rotating. It makes no sense. VAR yeah. showing itself in this match. We're going to see that more in World Cup qualifiers. That's an interesting nugget there. I think Kellen's got the PhD himself on the topic of uh, PK, time-wasting – uh, getting in the getting in people's heads. He's pretty good at it. Let's uh, let's just get to it. Let's get to it right now. Coming up today on the show: U.S. Qatar, Canada, Mexico. Mark Anthony K. Sebastian Drusi. I said it all that. Uh, real quick. Go check out the Jim Curtin interview that Cobb did. It's really really good. He said it's his best in seven or eight years. We've done a couple with him during that time, but you know, I'll give I'll give them their their props here. Well done. It was an awesome interview. Uh, and Doyle has some work on the side as well. Let's just jump in right now and let's start with uh with VAR in this game for Canada I thought both the penalties were legit I thought at the end of the game I had so much regret for Canada because both of them were completely unnecessary moments that would have changed the game Ache Ache wouldn't have been winning the game he would have been potentially tying the game you may never have gotten to that point and those are the little margins I think that Canada is going to have to I don't know iron out a little bit before they hit World Cup qualifying you, you gave us the Tejan Buchanan spiel there, Dave. But, Charlie, I, I want to go to you on him, man. I mean, this is what you've been crowing about for years at this point, even when oh, maybe yeah. we didn't want to hear it. And, and I'll yep. admit to not not seeing this at the beginning of your campaign. What's the price tag now, man? What's Bruce Arena looking at? Can he keep well, him? Well, the answer is yes, because the Revolution want to win MLS Cup. This is their best opportunity to win MLS Cup right now. And you, if you sell a Matt Turner, if you sell a Tejan Buchanan before this season ends, you, you are taking a big hit and you are basically throwing that opportunity out the window. So if they do sell Tejan or Matt Turner at some point this summer, you know, it's, it's going to be after January where they, they can depart. There's no way they're going to allow them to leave when this team has a real shot at winning MLS Cup. And Tejan is special. And I don't think you sell him for anything less than $8 million. $8 million is is the minimum. And his price tag is going to continue to, to rise because he's showing he's versatile. He can play right back, right wing back, right. At, he's, a, he's an attacking player, but he can play all over the place because he has that mentality that he's going to do whatever it takes to win on the pitch. And that's what I've noticed since day one when, when I watched him. I said, okay, this kid's gonna, this kid has something special. One, just the confidence to beat players on the dribble 1v1. He's very quick and strong, but it's more so his mentality. He plays with that chip on his shoulder. It, it's almost like a, a little bit like a Clint Dempsey, always trying to prove himself. He's never, he never thinks he's made it. He's never happy with himself. He's always trying to go out there to say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to win. I'm going to beat you and, and I'm, I'm better than you. And I love that. I love that attitude. So um, this this is a special player, and I, and I love to see him, you know, now fully blossoming in front of our eyes. How does he change Canada, Dave? 
Because it, it wasn't this before this tournament. This is his coming out party, at least on the Canada side. He wasn't in the youth national teams. He wasn't this big prospect. He wasn't Alfonso Davies. He wasn't Jonathan David. But now he's, I'm not saying he's going to approach their level, but he's knocking on the door. Like, he, he's a game winner in this region. Yeah, I. and while he wasn't part of the youth national teams, you got to give Canada credit because the way they built the Olympic team around him, which struggled, gave him that first taste of, what it means to have the team on his shoulders at the CONCACAF level. Um, and then when you just look at what it means for this tournament is it's not all on Alfonso Davies anymore. Like this, look what just happened. The, Alfonso Davies as a, as a teenager was a golden boot winner and Canada got to a quarterfinal. Now he doesn't even come to a tournament and Tejan Buchanan and other pieces are able to get them all the way to a semifinal where they probably deserve to make it even further. So this is a depth that Canada has never seen before. It's pieces that John Herdman can use in different ways. It felt like six, seven weeks ago, okay, he had figured out the five-man back line, how Davies works as, you know, that wing wing back that can kind of go wherever he wants, Laren off of him. But every team in World Cup qualifying would kind of know what they were going to see because that's all it was. Now how does he use Tejan? When does he use Tejan? Uh, you know, now we talked about these three game windows. Is it Fonzie for the first game, Tejan at home game two, and then no. Fonzie on the road? <laughs> you is start, it both you start of them? them? You start them every game. You, you can't, All right, you can't Charlie, afford, chill for them. a second. Chill for a second. Tell, You're going to start both wrong. of them at wing back? You're no, going to no, go no. on the road in CONCACAF and start both of them at wing back. Why, why would you have to start either of them at wing back if, if, you, if you had to? You could, one, they could, they're both starters every game. Mm-hmm. There's not there's not a question. Tejan can play right wing back. He can also play where Osorio was playing in that left wing back spot, inverted inverted winger, how, however you want to call it. Alfonso can play there because he is he was an attacking player before he went over to Bayern Munich. And in CONCACAF especially, he's going to be dynamic as an attacker where you don't need him to defend. And you also know he's going to track back anyways because that's just in, in his nature. So you play both of them. Every every match, you you may have to tinker depending on who you're playing because maybe they're starting positions a little bit uh, further back versus when you you know you're going to be on the ball more, you're going to have more opportunities, then you can play them higher up the field. But both of them, you find a way. If you're Coach Herdman, you play your best 11, and that would mean starting both of those players. In the course of and this match, he played this. a bunch of different positions too. He played on the right. He's, we, he switched over to the left-hand side where he got his goal. I think by the end, he was playing almost as like a second striker up top when they were kind of dropping in and uh, and doing a lot of defending, but needing someone to kind of get uh, get out and hit on the break a bit. But that's the thing about him is when I watched him, I think, you know, the beginning of his MLS coming out party was near the end of last season for, for those, unlike Charlie, that had been tracking him even before that. Uh, but you saw him playing more that wing back role. And you saw what the amount of space that he was able to cover um, with a with a solid head of steam, how good he could be kind of contributing to the attack. But then you're like, oh, maybe that's a better spot for him because he might not have that sort of, killer instinct or finishing ability closer to the goal to be a a true winger. And then you watch more and more and you're like, well, actually he's got that. I mean, he's putting doing double step overs, finishing to the back post. Um, So it's just like, it it does feel like you're watching him continue to grow. I think they said in the broadcast tonight too, where he's still getting better, Um, which is why I think if you're new England, you, you, you can afford a little bit of time to maybe not just try and take the money now while you can because maybe you feel like it's fool's gold or it's he's going to have a dip in form. It seems like he's actually still growing in his game. So, uh, And for every club, I said this last time, uh, every club is different. So while Dallas or Philly might make more sense to sell early uh, for a club like New England that hasn't won MLS Cup, that's got to be priority number one. And then you get you you still want to do right by the player. You still want to have them go on. That's good for the club as well, too, financially and as far as their prestige goes and bringing more players along. But he's also not a homegrown player. So he's not like a kid that came up through the academy uh, or anything like that. They, they did a good job finding him and give him a platform. But, um, yeah, he, he was he – was, uh, I feel like doing that on the stage that happened tonight is definitely going to make that, that price tag, whenever it happens, go up. <laughs> Can it's we throw out another shout way. out to a yeah. draft pick, Alistair Johnston? Yep. What a year he's had. Yep. I mean, he's a lockdown starter, whether it's right center back or right wing back for them. And that versatility, one, covering for Tejan to allow him to get into the attack and do what he does, or Richie when it's swapped. Uh, and then his versatility to step in and out. And I thought he was good again today. 
and Daniel Henry struggled. He has struggled the last three games he's played mm-hmm. for Canada. So they were myth- they were missing Stephen Vittoria. And yeah, Alistair Johnson's performance didn't drop. Neither did Kamal Miller's, who maybe this was his best game. And this is the third straight game we've said that about him. So huge performance on the back line, a bunch of super draft picks, uh, still getting it done for this Canadian team. And they kind of are starting to build that platform where we talked about the attackers. We knew they could score goals. Then you see Kay. Then you see Osorio. Ustakio comes into the team. Atiba. Okay, the midfield's there. The back line has been the question mark. And I think it's less so coming out of this tournament. To a semifinal. To the brink of a final. Almost. Just seconds, perhaps. A few calls. A few inches. A decision or two away from knocking off Mexico. And perhaps making history. Well, they wanted to be there. They won't be, but World Cup qualifying is coming. Didn't have Alfonso Davies. They didn't have Jonathan David. Kyle Laren left this tournament. No Ayakanola. He got hurt. Cavallini is out in this game. I mean, you go through the players that they didn't have but likely will, and, you know, look, fate is a funny thing. We don't know what's going to happen come September and beyond. This team's going to be there. Before we get to the U.S., my last question, because Simon Borg put it out there on Twitter the other day. U.S. and Mexico, they're the top two. We know that. Who's the third best team? Is it Canada? Have they taken that step? Have they pushed Honduras or Costa Rica or you know whoever it is that's, that's cont- Jamaica maybe contending for that title out? Is it them? Uh, I can't say that yet. Yeah, I'm one I'm, thing I'm with about you, Concacaf. Guys. Yeah, one thing about Concacaf is it's what you do in this region. It's not about what clubs you play for. It's not about the trophies you win in Europe. It's not about what you've done other places or or even how you do in a world like. Everything about this region is unique and a challenge. And Canada, this was a great tournament, but we need to see in World Cup qualifying, we need to see them go to San Pedro Sula. We need them to go to San Jose, Costa Rica, and get results and show that they can play at that level and that they've surpassed some of those teams because none of those teams are giving you space, right? Honduras could roll out, you know, Carlos Pavone and Amado Guevara, and they'll still back tomorrow that's just the nature of this region so uh, Canada's not there yet but I feel better about everything uh, for this national team than I did 12 hours ago and a month ago and and they do too that's that's the thing this tournament was really important for their mentality and their belief and and now they know hey we took Mexico to the brink and technically to them Mexico are still the top dog in CONCACAF so if they can compete. And the funny thing is Herdman said, this is the first like real quality opponent that we're facing. I also took, <laughs> I also knew what he was doing there. I said, Oh, okay. A little shot at the U S there. Uh, the real the first real test that we have of a quality opponent. I go, okay. But I do appreciate the Canadian national team and, and what they bring. And, and it's a lot of youthful and experience but they they gained it just like the U.S. did in, in Nations League and in this tournament. There's a lot of players, a lot of new uh, new players coming into the fold now, feeling like they can compete at this level and get it done. And so for this Can- Canadian national team, I'm excited to watch them play. They they have a lot of, like you watch Tejon, Jonathan David, Alfonso Davies. They have these 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 playmakers that can change a game at, at any moment. So I, I'm really interested to see what it looks like when they go to. San Jose, and they play Costa Rica, a full-strength Costa Rican side, and they go to San Pedro Sula, play a Honduras for a World Cup qualifier. Then we really see what they're made of. They're fun, too. Also, in pure talent, I think Jamaica is the other part of that conversation. Yeah. Like, you talk about Canada missing players. Mikel Antonio, in form, might be the most dominant, you know, or definitely forward, but maybe player in this region. He wasn't at this tournament. Leon Bailey didn't play against the U.S., so that's the other one that would stand out in that combo alongside the traditional powers. Yeah, I'm, I'm anti third place games. Hate them. Don't like them. They're worthless. <laughs> but I'll watch this Canada Qatar game. All right. I'm going to watch that. I want to see them just a little bit more. The most fun team in the tournament. But adios. The U.S. on to their 12th Gold Cup final. You know, we're feeling Canada when we do like 20 minutes before we even get to the U.S. Uh, knocking off Qatar 1 nothing. It was not a vintage performance. You're going to XG. Qatar 2, U.S. 0.86. But Matt Turner's out here. He's the eraser. He's not having it. This was the performance we had been waiting for from Matt Turner. It's the PK disrupting performance we know and expect from Kellen Acosta. <laughs> it's Yossi Zardes coming up big at the end, just as uh, you know his haters might not like to see, but the rest of us basically expect at this point. <laughs> What's your one word 
Kaylin, what's your one word for this U.S. performance on their way to a final with whatever, the B, C, it doesn't matter team, a bunch of guys that are hungry and trying to earn a spot on those World Cup qualifying rosters? Why do you always come to me first on the one words? Ah, one word. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm still thinking of Turner because it's just – uh, I, to me, he was like the, the big standout. And when you look throughout the tournament as well, um, I think they've only given up one goal throughout. And yeah, the front line was not connecting. It, it didn't seem to work very well. DK, another sort of disappointing match. Um, Jossie did a good job coming in, as did all the subs that really uh, gave the team some life and energy and got the team moving forward. But the back line was really strong, uh, except for maybe even actually, I can't even say that today, um, even though they, they were able to keep a zero, they did give up a number of opportunities. But uh, it was Turner that whenever they ran into a couple opportunities, I mean, he kept us in us that first half. And uh, and then obviously, of course, with the uh, with the penalty, I mean, didn't save it, but um, yeah, maybe him and Acosta can share can share the uh, the the he, credit. He, for hold that on, one. he didn't save it. No, but he but held this, his ground. But afterwards, but afterwards, he literally said before this penalty, I tried to get in his head. I've been watching his penalties. I let him know that he mimicked his run up as he was walking back to the goal just to try to mess with the guy a little bit. Ah, I like that. He knew his run up so well. <laughs> that he and we've seen it. Turner on penalties too. So he, if, if they've done their homework on him, they'll have known uh, how good he can be on those. But I mean, that he, the the save, the, the one where it kind of he gets that fingertip across, it was just ridiculous uh, to be able to cut, get on that one, and then even preventing the own goal as well. So um, look, the team get, got got the result, had to uh, sort of fight for it a little bit in the end. But I, I really think the substitutes made a big difference coming into the match. Um, Jossie will get the headlines, but I also thought Roldan did well, um, and Giochini as well as uh, Cannon, and and pretty much at, to a man, the substitutions to, uh, panned out um, for for Berhalter tonight. I had resiliency because they weathered a storm, man. That first half, Qatar is knocking down the door. They were the better team, and and I think sort of by far is, is that possession number right. 58%, yes. but we got outshot 17 to 6. Yeah, I mean, the whole hey, first half is just a horseshoe, man. They were shooting just, from yeah. everywhere. <laughs> fair. That's fair. That's fair. Okay, continue. There's, Sorry, Weeby. Be resilient. No, no, it was just resiliency. I mean, essentially, <laughs> they got to the PK. Resiliency. They got to the PK, and once that went over, the whole mood seemed to change. And Charlie Bohm had the quote from the Qataris afterwards saying that we were just exhausted. After that, to a man, we just didn't have it in us anymore, and that's where the U.S. sort of flipped that switch, and Greg and his subs... And he tightened the, he tightened the bolt, right? Uh, and that's when I think the momentum really changed. So it's that resiliency to sort of last and last and last. And, and, you know, you hope in World Cup qualifying, it's the same story. And I know we keep bringing it back to that, but that's what you're thinking towards every time. And that's what I was thinking in this game. You don't play your best. You get dominated for large portions of the first hour and you still win. The points, the results are ultimately what matters. I know it's not a CONCACAF opponent, but these are the Asian champions. Like this is the team that if they're not automatically qualified are probably going to make the World Cup out of their confederation, which is not easy. So I think there's a lot to be proud of in this game. And, and I think you, if you're Greg Berhalter, you look at that first hour as sort of a, the price you pay for playing the team that you, that you have. You've given young guys opportunities who, by and large, if you were to say right now, are they ready for a semifinal before the tournament started? We probably would have said no across the board on a lot of guys. And now we know that they are, even if the performance wasn't at an A-plus level. They are. And then you have old, old reliable at the end, man. Giassi. Greg said if it was a qualifier, he would have started him. Well, and I get that. He comes in. He changes the game. His movement is just, at this point, clearly better than Daryl's. And that's okay. Daryl's still, he's still figuring it out. He's a year into his pro career. And then he's in the right place at the right time. Um, so I, resiliency for me is mine. Dave, do you have one? I thought exciting. And not exciting the way the U.S. played. I think won the game. Right, the energy, the atmosphere in Austin at Q2 Stadium, fans back in the stadium. Like it felt like a US game. It felt like a semifinal, a World Cup qualifier, whatever it was. And then I think to all the things you said, to watch them win that. Like these are young guys. These are guys who are learning. These are a lot of players that we hope will have bright futures. Um, so to watch them get through all of that and make it to a final against Mexico, I think all of that's exciting, even if the soccer wasn't as pure as we want it to be. And it hasn't really been over the last year. Um, but I don't know, man. If Greg walks out with two trophies and goes into World Cup qualifying this summer and, like, didn't even mean to win the second one, that's not a bad way for it to go. Uh, 
after the year or two he's had of just not having the team, not being able to play, all the question marks, all the young players he's trying to bring through. That would be pretty wild uh, as for that to be the way all this ends. You've had some time with the thesaurus here, Charlie. Give me a good word, man. You got a good one? Execution. Job finished. Literally, the goal was to get to a final with this group. They got to the final, and they're playing against Mexico, who are going to be the favorites. And so when you look at the, the team that he's put together, I mean, there's not one star. Their star is the goalkeeper. That That's who's been really the stars, Matt Turner. Jossie Zardes has, has come in and fulfilled the role because DK, if anything, has had his stock drop in this tournament. And it's not because of the, the shoulder injury in this, in this match in particular, but I would say over the course of the tournament, you've seen a lot of his deficiencies where he has to improve. And, and that's why, you know, he, he hasn't been, you know, sold yet because his first touch, it still needs to improve drastically. His, his ability to take, take players on on the dribble and just being able to maneuver around the box with that first touch, the second touch to set up the shot needs to improve drastically, his involvement in the game. And so I think as that evolves, and, and that's why Greg Berhalter was giving him those chances because no one else has stepped up, so why not continue to try and allow him to develop as a starter with the U.S. Men's National Team because there, there hasn't been a striker to say, hey, this is my spot. I'm going to keep it. Now, Jossie's artist, he, he owns that spot now because of performance and because he's consistent and he has that relationship with Greg Berhalter. He knows what he's going to get out of him. So I'd say from that standpoint, you, you knew what you were going to get. There's a lot of youngsters who are learning on the fly, getting that experience and not quite up to that level yet of the A team. They're trying to get their shot, get their foot in the door for those World Cup qualifiers. But this is a this is a team that I think got to a final mission complete, and now you're going to play against Mexico and see see what kind of test you can give them. I think they're going to be to, uplifted seeing what Canada did uh, tonight versus them, and that really gives them a shot heading into the final. And you know, Tata Martino, maybe he changes things up. Maybe you know that that goal, uh, Nations League final messed him up the the psyche when he's competing against the U.S. men's national team. I don't know. Let's go. <laughs> there, there's no way you could say Mexico is coming in on confidence. This has been one of the worst Gold Cups they've had, and, and they still made a final. That's the quality we're talking about. But you drew Trinidad and Tobago. They've struggled to score goals in clear ways. There, there isn't defined ways this team knows how to attack. I mean, just look at the penalty kicks today. you got Orbel and Pineda, who's – now 25, but considered, you know, one of the younger players on this group. Why isn't Ache Ache taking that? Where's Tecatito? And then Carlos Salcedo takes the second one. All of that to me showed you got a group that's confused where they are. There isn't a clear identity either in the soccer or in the culture. But taking that aside and going back to what Charlie was saying and like job done and the way they did it, you got DK and Busio and Vines and Shaq Moore, all of them. You got them all this experience. And maybe DK is not ready this year. Maybe he's not ready next year. Whatever it is, I believe long term he will be. And this will be good experience for him. And you still made the final. Like all of that is huge for Greg to be able to get what he sort of wanted out of this tournament and still be facing Mexico and Las Vegas. Can I take this wider? What is, and I'm going to throw it to you, Kalen, put you on the spot here. What is the number nine depth chart for you right now? Yours, personally. Not necessarily what Greg Berhalter is going to do, but World Cup qualifying, this is sort of the the boop, 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 how you take it down. I would go Giassi, Sargent, and then DK. Um, unless somebody – I think that's the way I see it now. And, and I, I, I have to say I was disappointed because – I really felt like DK had a little bit more, was more ready than what we've seen so far. Um, just based on, you know, the, the momentum that he had going coming from the championship. And I just felt like that was maybe the moment sort of slipped away from him or he wasn't able to carry it forward. Or maybe to Charlie's point is he, he wasn't quite ready. And I thought he was a little further along. And I thought that this gold cup in particular against, um, you know, against some good opponents, but maybe not, he hasn't had to go against Mexico yet. I know he's had some tough matches, but I, I felt like this would be a good platform for him to really 
take that number nine position and uh, carry that forward into World Cup qualifiers. But I just don't think he. I think he's still got it. He's still in the picture and in the mix. Um, but I think right now Jossie is the guy that, as you and not just based on tonight, but like as you, it, it was always like, can one of these young guys step up and take their chance to take this spot from him? Because we kind of know what he's going to be, and it's solid and it's good and it's consistent. Um, but it's not maybe the uh, top next level that maybe U.S. men's national team fans are, have gotten a peek at with these young emerging talents like Reyna or uh, Christian or Weston or these other, you know, Dest, all these guys. Um, but you know what? I, I feel like Jossie can do the can do the business and he proved it tonight because it's like if you understand that you get those good wing play around it and you saw it right there with Giacchini and that little cutback, you can bank that Jossie's going to be, be in the right position, understanding uh, where to be in the box to be able to get the get the tap in and he puts his shots always on frame. So that that's the way I see the the number nine position. I was, I guess, um, maybe like some other people hoping that one of the young players would take their opportunities. But to this point, they haven't yet. It doesn't mean that they won't in the future or, or won't need to be counted upon um, during World Cup qualifiers at all. Uh, I think they both will have a big role to play. But right now, I'd say this is Jossie's spot. Uh, Zardis said I after think- this, quote, one thing I never do, I never question the coach's decision. They're the ones that do all the research on and you know game methodology, et cetera, et cetera. And I could only help but think back to when he said, "I'm not a right back." There was but one decision that Chelsea's <laughs> artists didn't respect. There, everybody's mean- got to draw the line somewhere. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I give him. But we, people have talked a lot about that, right? And it hinted at like all the backlash that he's faced or whatever. And you got to give him a ton of credit because he really has. I mean, that was sort of emblematic of even within his own organization or within a team being kind of fallen out of favor and, you know, finding form actually through uh, going to Columbus and getting into a system that suited him where he wasn't being asked to do too much or he didn't need to maybe uh, like, you know, really create on his own. Uh, It was more just about being a part of a system, holding up the ball, getting in behind, making good runs in the box and finishing your chances. And that's what we've seen him do consistently. And uh, to his credit, he's put his head down, shut out the noise through all the doubters. Um, And uh, look, you know, it doesn't, I I also understand on the other side, uh, like I just made the point, you're hoping for more competition at every position. We're seeing that now in the goalkeeper position with, you know, we've got three really good options now. Um, And we want more of that with outside backs. We're seeing that with center backs, which is still being decided. You want uh, Acosta is now coming in and Legette and these guys that are, I think, proving throughout this tournament that they can play a big role with the first team. I was just hoping to see a little bit more of that from the number nine position, which I think is still um, a position where where we're lacking a little bit of readiness in our depth. Charlie, here's the question for you, man. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying the two things that stuck out to me about Daryl before move over and Charlie mentioned it. One was his activity, especially in a game like this. When Qatar got numbers forward, he wasn't an outlet and he wasn't chasing balls into the channel. And the other, which I, I was a little surprised by, but you know, you guys would know better than me at this golf and, and change in quality. He wasn't able to hold defenders off when he was in position. He had a few times where he's played through the way he wanted to. And whether it's the speed, the strength, or maybe just his reading of the moment, he kind of allowed the defenders to get through him and get to the other side of the ball. And that's not something I thought he would struggle with. Yeah, I agree. You got to have a floor. The only thing I'll add is, and and Chuck, you can chime in too, because, you know, we've got a pretty good U.S. number nine here. But I I would just say, like, on your not, if you're not having your best day as far as your footwork goes or you're not feeling on or your timing is a little bit off, like, you have to at least know that you're going to be a nuisance or the floor has to be that you're going to, occupy space you're going to stretch the field you're getting behind if you miss a couple chances okay fine maybe you don't have your touch right or whatever but you're going to draw fouls you're going to be busy and that was the part where i was saying where i still feel like he can be so useful and his uh you know his skill set can be so useful to the u.s because it's not always going to be a let's pass it all the way through the field and create these beautiful patterns and get there. Like against some teams, we're going to have to play a little bit more direct. I think at times we've been a little too reticent to play direct um, throughout the gold cup. And that's where I would have liked to see just that maybe a little bit just of like getting it up to him and him making a run that would demand the pass. We saw it just a couple times and it caused problems over the last two matches, but you saw the one um, with not really early that he got called off on where he waved his hand for it and his touch was off or he wasn't there, but it was a dangerous moment. Exactly. 
Charlie, here's the question for you. World Cup qualifier tomorrow. Who are you starting in goal? Matt Turner, Zach Steffen, Ethan oh, Horvath. If it's a hard one, questions. yeah, no. If if it, it's it's not that hard actually. If you're telling me tomorrow, I'm going with the keeper who's playing right now in form, and that's Matt Turner. If it's tomorrow, I'm going with Matt Turner because he's had a full seat now, 16 games in Major League Soccer. He's had a full Gold Cup. The guy's on fire. He's playing unreal, and he, he's done it for a while now. But he's so informed and healthy and fit, you don't have to worry about it, that he has to be your starter now. He's been so consistent. You know, Zach Steffen, when he's fit and he's on his game, he's, he's there's a reason why he's at Manchester City. And, and the yeah, he's not playing all the time, but he still gets FA Cups. He's still seeing the most, you know, incredible, talented players in training every day. But you need reps. He's not getting it right now, and he's and he had to deal with with an injury. So, in that case, you can't just have him be cold and start World Cup qualifier. You bring him into camp, but Matt Turner, he's got the keys right now. He's got the keys. He's got the keys. Charlie, tomorrow, September, October, November, January, December, yeah. March. Mm -hmm. This situation might not be different than it is right now in terms of playing yeah. time for your club team. Yeah, you're you're right. I mean, and that's the national team. You don't just go based on merit. You go where who's in form, who's fit, who's 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 getting a good opportunity. You know, there are occasions where if Christian Pulisic isn't playing at Chelsea, he's still going to start with the national team. <laughs> like, hold on. What are you about to say? <laughs> you know? but, on, but, but, <laughs> but but in, in, in other positions, especially in the goalkeeper position, you have to start with the, the player who's getting – minutes who's playing who's who's hot who's been consistent now if there was no other keepers who were actually coming up with these big time saves and, and showing that they're a supreme shot stopper then zach stefan's easily going to slide in as the number one but right now if there's ever a, an opportunity to kind of surpass someone who's at a major club and has, has done all this uh you know incredible work behind him but is not currently fit it's Matt Turner, and he he he's earned it. He's played himself into the number one position, and I firmly believe that. You know, this is this is a national team that has now depth and talent up the wazoo. Number nine in the number nine position, we haven't had someone solidify that yet. Now, what I have liked to see from Josh Sargent this preseason is he's playing as a striker, he's scoring, and that gives me confidence that he's going to be in his position for the whole season. He's not going to be moved around to right midfield, left midfield, and, you know, really focused on defending to, to survive relegation. But, you know, for, for me, Jossie would get the, would get the start right now because he's like, he's like a grown man. He's playing, you know, he's playing like a man with, with a ton of experience and not so much in that role of, ah, I still got to develop. So he would get the start for me right now in CONCACAF. That's not to say in 2022 in the World Cup that he's your starting striker. But right now, when you need to get results, you know you can depend on him. He's going to be consistent. Leave it to a number nine to start a goalkeeping conversation and bring it right back to the forward position. But hey, hey, I have <laughs> but it is, But it is interesting, the connection there of um, the challenge for Greg in the two spots, right? Matt Turner is in form and is fighting to earn that spot. Where on the flip side, as Kalen said, no one has stepped in at the forward position. So you have two arguments in different ways. One is, well, Zach Steffen, he's the veteran. He's got the experience and he plays at Man City for Pep Guardiola, who's pretty good at what he does. And then you've got Matt Turner, who's playing in incredible form and Horvath. I don't even know how to fit him into this whole thing, but no one's playing like a Matt Turner at number nine to like take that spot. And so Zardes continues to earn it. Um, and so there are two different challenges for Greg to deal with. It's but lovely challenges. I'll tell you that. If you're a coach, I, and I, I spoke to Greg about this, and when you have so many talented young players who, for, mo for the most part, don't have a ton of international experience, but they are performing at their clubs, and you, you look at the depth chart and you're like, look at the right back spot. You got like seven real legit options. Seven. And then you, you go down the line, okay, center back's a little bit thin, but now I think you, you saw Miles Robinson, I think, has stepped up as it made huge leaps and bounds. And now he's really put himself in the conversation of, 
you know, a, a potential starting center back for the U.S. men's national team. When you're talking about World Cup qualifiers, Sam Vines, another player needs to get a little, still needs to get a little bit stronger, but I think has improved in my mind as a left back as an option. I, I didn't think he would be there yet. I think it'd still take him some time, but now I saw a little bit more from him in the, the tactical awareness, you know, getting up and down, being a little bit more consistent, but still that strength needs to come up because when you're starting to play some of these, these real hungry conquer calf attackers, you, you're going to need to eat that. That's why beans. I'm excited for Mexico really. Cause I, I mean, we talk about the, these steps in development and we're still going to learn so much more in this final. And we saw how much the U S team grew in the nation's league final against Mexico last time. And when you play against the best, like how it raises your game or challenges you or, exposes you at times and, and that's one where i'm like oh man you look at those mexico wingers and you're saying okay shack Moore and vines right it's been nice we've had the ball a lot of the time you've had to worry about some counterattacks, but this is going to be a little bit different um going against mexico and so you get a little bit more information i i know we're probably going to jump into that matchup a little bit more we be i mean to jump the gun uh, you take you're just hosting this i was about to take us there so i'm okay. just sitting back in the crowd <laughs> just enjoying <laughs> but i do think there'll be some changes um to the side because exactly to your point earlier we be when greg talked about trusting the young players wanting to let them learn wanting them to let them grow but also if you haven't taken your opportunity by now it's time to make some changes. That's where I think we see Zardes come in up top. And I think uh, probably Christian Roldan comes in for uh, Busio as well. Um, I, I would guess, I would guess those would be two, at least two changes there that I see from, from before um, just because it's, I, I don't know if either guy, although they have, they have so much talent. It's, I just don't know if either of them have really uh, have maybe that experience or are ready for that final. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he sticks with them and goes with them still. But I just think of when I when I think of Christian Roldan, like that's a guy I want in a final, um, and a guy that has more experience. And when he came on, he played well. He looked up for it. Um, and I feel like being around that middle and midfield is such an important position, um, defensively even, um, to to really get in and break plays up. And then um, just having that savvy and experience playing in a final is a little different. So I think those two changes for sure. Um, but I mean, I, I do think Mexico will be big favorites and I think they will, despite them not having um, their best performances or co maybe coming in and the U.S. feeling a lot better in a way than coming off their last match. I think they're going to smell a little bit of blood in the water and think that this U.S. team is is not the same U.S. team that they played in the Nations League final and that there are weaknesses. You look at the chances, even when you watch the film of Qatar today and the chances that we conceded some of the giveaways that we gave away uh, that, that created opportunities. Um, and then the way that Matt Turner had to kind of bail us out at times to keep us even in the match um, leading into the second half. I, I think Mexico will look at that and say, I think this is a final where we can, we can get some, some revenge. Dave, is it convenient uh, narrative building on our part, U S men's national team uh, fans and Twitter's part to be like, like Charlie said, uh, all good, mission accomplished. Like, this is gravy. <laughs> no worries. Mexico, it's on you. Don't get fired, Tata. <laughs> you know, like, is that convenient? Or is that just what's up? I think that's the reality. The The U.S. had to win a trophy this summer. They already did, like, a month and a half ago. So this whole tournament was, well, what can you get out of it? What's the value of it? But the, okay, we need to learn how to win now was done in Denver with Charlie running around with people up in the upper deck, uh, jumping off stands. <laughs> like and like, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that already happened. That's what that was. That was Reyna, Pulisic, Sergeant, Tyler, uh, you know, Weston. Can you guys be winners for the U.S. men's national team? Can you lead this team uh, without, you know, those veteran presence that we've had in the past? And they proved that. So this was about everything we've talked about. And – no one's ever going to tell this group that's stepping on a field with Mexico that you can give anything but your best and that you don't expect to win. Because that's always been the expectation. You remember those years where we'd play friendlies and it would be a CB, you know, Jimmy Conrad gets a header goal and Landon scoring off of referees. And there'd be these games that we thought maybe the U.S. wouldn't be in and we'd always win them or we'd, we'd fight with them. And that's part of building the culture back up of the U.S. men's national team. So there's no expectation there, but if we said it four weeks ago, 
it's not convenient to now say it again, right? Like we have ETR episodes of us saying this isn't about winning. The only focus is not winning. If they don't win, it's not a failure. Like we can't go through all of that. Now get to this point and say, oh no, now they have to win. But you're in a final. You've got a job to do and there should be a level of expectation with these players. How do you think Greg will set it up, Charlie? Give me a give me a eye into the future. Sunday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, FS1. I think he, he makes more than two changes. I think Zardes starts up top in that lone striker position. I think Ariola comes off. I think they bring on either Eric Williamson or Roldan. I would, I would assume they're going to bring on um, an Eric Williamson. You keep Matthew Hoppy on there as more of an attacker, and then you bring on Roldan for a Busio. Acosta and Legette stay in the midfield. Uh, Reggie Cannon starts right, right back. Sands, Robinson, Vines, Turner. I think that's that's who you go with. The, the, you need a little bit more now, guys with that grit, the mentality. So players who are, players who are gonna who are gonna look to come in and really, you know, kind of uh, come in with with strong tackles, get on the ball, trying to expose them on the counter every now and then with Jossie Zardes, who who will stretch the back line. You, you saw a lot of, of positive things from Canada, but the thing that Canada has that the U.S. doesn't have is Tejan Buchanan. So that's a player who can create chances by himself on the dribble with pace, and, and he's a goal threat as well. The U.S. does not have that in, in their roster right now. So, Charlie, I agree with you, but don't you think all those things you just described in Greg Burhalter's head are Paul Ariola? Like, I don't... I, I didn't. He's coming I, off no. an injury. It's been yeah. tough, mm-hmm. but but all those things you described, those are normally when he uses Paul. I I, I agree with you in in that sense because he's very predictable in the way he plays. But if you watch them tonight, it is you, you didn't get anything out of him. He works hard, but you need a little bit more than that when you're playing against Mexico. It can't be someone who's just going to work hard. There's got to be a little bit more, and I think you get verse more more of a dynamic player like Eric Williamson who can get on the ball and relieve, relief relieve pressure. But also when you see him with Diego Chara, yes, there's the back and forth with him. He can, he can cover for Diego and Diego wants to go on those mazy runs. I think you get more with him because he, he's going to be that inverted winger. Who's going to come in and help the midfield, but he can also get on the attack and create something. So from that standpoint, Paul Ariola is maybe a, a great option coming off the bench. Someone who's going to be north and south and get in behind and be very direct. I think uh, you, you stick with uh, Joe Akini coming off the bench. I think he's also shown that, you know, you could get something out of him. There's something there. He has, he's still developing. He's young. But this is a player that I think also has, has a bright future and could be a game changer off the bench. Does the U.S. win? Then we'll move on. We got a lot to talk about. Does the U.S. win? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> is that a hopeful yes? <laughs> <or is> that, <laughs> a... <laughs> that was sort of like a... a... I'm going to say yes. <laughs> like, it wasn't like it's yes. It's it's a hundred percent yes for me. It was like a oh, easy answer, you know. It's like the kid who's who gets convinced to get on the water slide. That, like, that was... I'm going to go down. That was, that was epic, Goss. You said <laughs> this is exactly what went through your mind. He said, "I'm going to say." Everyone's going to come after me and hate me um, if I say, but, okay, yeah, they're going to win. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> my Listen, mind, my one, mind tells if me. I said anything, uh, if I said anything 100%, I'd be a fool. Andrew <laughs> yeah. Say anything 100%. That's fair. You're out of your mind. You'd be a charlatan. You would. You would. But I feel similar to how I felt for Canada going into the Mexico game. Maybe, maybe not as strong, but stronger in other places. I just think on both sides, you're looking at a Mexico team, as I said, that I just don't think is is in a high level of form, doesn't have a ton of confidence. And when you look at this matchup, while the U.S. was pulled apart at times by Qatar, which is a totally different attacking unit than what you're looking at with Mexico, where they're fluid, they have ideas of how they want to play, they're a cohesive unit. Mexico has individual talent, but they don't really seem to fit together right now. You're looking at a U.S. team that's given up one goal all tournament. So I don't think this is a team – I don't think this is a game the U.S. is going to have to chase. And I think it kind of goes into their into the way they, they want to play and they have played. Now you look at Zardes being able to hold up the ball and launch people on the counterattack. 
if Mexico steps higher, does that give room for Matthew Hoppy to run into or any of the other players that Kalen and Charlie talked about coming into this game? I mean, how good has Roldan been in transition for Seattle over the course of this year? How good is Williamson if it's him? Um, so I think this kind of fits into the U.S. game plan, maybe even more than Qatar does. And then I just I just see the pressure on this Mexico team. And I see it on Tata as well. And, and you hear it in what he's saying and how he talks about it and how he's distance from the Olympic team and what he's focused on and what he's doing. I just think you go into a game where there's zero pressure, zero expectation on this U.S. team with all the energy and the excitement of playing in this new stadium in front of the crowd and all these things. And it's the opposite experience for Mexico. And I see a really good opportunity for the U.S. to squeak one out. So now I sound more convincing. I That's can't say that there's me. no pressure, though, because anytime it's U.S. Mexico, there's pressure. Like I, I, I understand. I my mind tells me that Mexico are definitely the favorites in this one. Um, and I think if there is a path forward for the U.S., it's going to have to be the exact same way that they've been doing it, which is not conceding goals and uh, having some. I think it might take uh, it might take some more like heroics in goal it might take some more uh we i think we probably need to get a little more out of our set pieces we we haven't really gotten enough out of those throughout the play and then following a little bit of canada's lead which was to be to and and referencing the nation's league performance which is even if it's not pretty to find a way to fight through it and gut out however you can which is i think will go into the personnel choices you make um i think it will be hard Reggie Cannon is a guy I'd like to see come in, but it might be hard to change the back four just considering they haven't given up much. Although Shaq Moore did get beat a couple times, but I think he's by and large had an excellent tournament. Um, but I, it's going to take some of what Canada had. And the other thing that they had, which Charlie rightly points out, is is uh, Tejan Buchanan. But we don't have that. But being able to find ways or moments to turn around Mexico and make them Turn and chase is where they really run into problems. They, they don't feel comfortable when the ball, even on the play earlier where it's even just a hopeful long ball and Tesho kind of wins a bad bounce and then lays it off um, earlier on in the match for a chance. It's like they're just turning them around will cause some problems for them, even if it's to Jossie or maybe Ariola or whoever it might be, Hoppy getting wide, um, getting them to have to face their own net, I think is going to cause problems for Mexico and unbalance them. So, uh, but I, I think it's going to be a tough one. Mexico, I think they're, they, they scare me. Uh, they're, so, they're legit. So who, who wins? Uh, my, my mind is telling me Mexico, but I can't go on the record and pick Mexico in this one. Yeah. Like I can't do it. Quite so, on Blanco over here. I mean, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if he's watching, but uh, yeah. <laughs> is your I, I do, no, I, it's not just that. I will say, I, th I do think you're right to the point where if the longer the match goes on and it's 0-0 zero, zero or it's 1-1 one, one and it's close, right, and the U.S. is up for the fight, I think that's where it starts to starts to switch, where if it, if it goes bad early, I mean, it was amazing how we dug ourselves out against in the Nations League final, but I don't think that would be a recipe for success. Um, you know, even today, the margins are going to be smaller where Sands makes an uncharacteristic bad pass against Qatar. It might not be a goal against Mexico. That might end up being a goal and one where you're in a, in a deep hole. So uh, I think the longer the game goes on, I could see it starting to switch over to the U.S. And those are good moments where I, I like the U.S.'s depth and the way Berhalter has been using his substitutions. So that's the path forward. I'm, I'm, I'm charting for the U.S. to come in and get a dramatic late winner. Charlie, we just got to so both go. You are just straight extra time jinx this, man. Because we got to get Boys the bus now. Reason. We don't got time to, to filibuster our choices here. <laughs> yeah, the U.S. wins. And and Goss ah, touched on it. We are going to get Me cans. We're going to be done. Last <laughs> yeah. Mexico. Mexico is worn out. It, it is it is so clear and obvious. Famous last Ed, words. Edson Alvarez was like getting – he was get, getting beasted. He looked like he had nothing left. The tank was empty. Um it, that is a I, good point, honestly, and one I've been thinking about a ton this week, which is why did we wait essentially a week between like group and knockout and then four days from Sunday to Thursday, and then it's Friday, Saturday is your rest, you're playing a final on Sunday. That's tough. Games. Yeah, it, 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 they just look like they have nothing left. And I do think Matt Turner is going to be tested once again in this match. It, for For the U.S. to win, Matt Turner is going to have to stand on his head like he did today. And that was against a Qatar. That that yeah. wasn't against 
uh, Mexico. And everyone could say, hey, U.S. has only scored, given up one goal. Well, if we want to be ultra critical, and I'm going to be ultra critical on this U.S. men's national team because I know the potential they had have, you played against Haiti. You played against Martinique. Sure, you played against the Canada, but it wasn't – they were kind of like, we're not going to give it all. Jamaica, very, really not that strong either, and Qatar. So you shouldn't be giving up all the goals on those teams. Now, Mexico, that's their A team. They didn't have a good game against Canada. You know Tata Martino is going to do everything he can to motivate them, and he shouldn't have to motivate them to play against the U.S., especially losing Nations League, to come out and make a point. So now they will be tested. This was a semifinal. you got to get to a final. Yes, it's going to be hard. But now show me what you're made of. All right, this I'm is, taking this is the I'm, game. I'm taking Mexico. Just to prevent nice, the extra time job. curse. Go ahead, go ahead, you know what? I'm playing on my grenade uh, trilogy. This is my sacrifice for you. Just I remember it. it. I thought Just about it. Just remember it. 8.30 yeah. p.m. Eastern, FS1, Sunday. We'll be there for the pregame to talk lineups uh, on Twitter spaces. And then right here again on the postgame. Uh, let's keep it going, talk MLS here. We will get to the uh, the venues that the U.S. Soccer Federation has announced for the USMNT's seven home qualifiers. Right now we know Canada's Nashville. We know Jamaica's Austin. Uh, we know Mexico is Cincinnati, which is a big shock. And reports are that Columbus will get Costa Rica. There will be three left. That's El Salvador, Honduras, and Panama. All those in 2022. They said, we're going somewhere with grass. So don't hit us up, Sounders fans. But everybody else, if you want them to come, make your case for your city, all right? Portland, where, too. Where should, yeah, where you, you, you know, you know, go? you know, Audi Field's getting one. DC. You think so? I just, I don't know. Like, Minnesota, just, Kansas City. There's some good spots out there. Let us know what you oh, think. Oh, you just gonna stay, You're gonna stay Midwest. Zero miles. No. Extra time at <laughs> MLSTalker.com. Just nothing. No. Central Time Zone, Charlie. No, it's, it's the best it. non-coast. All right, that's where the that's where all the interesting people live. All right, hey, Yankee talk. Stadium has grass. Yeah, where were you uh, <laughs> when the Mark Anthony K trade happened? What was your reaction to this one, Dave? Tom Bogart out here, Tommy Scoops, Rapids picking up Martha. Yeah, McCarthy. big one. Yeah, what for like what, a million yeah. in GAM? 2022 international yeah. spot. There's some incentives here. It could go to more than a million. He's 26, is Mark Anthony K. Yeah, what this is one of the more exciting trades for me as a neutral because MLS is a unique league and teams operate in different ways. And there's like a world in which things can just work out for everyone. And so you look at a team in the Colorado Rapids who aren't going out and acquiring players from outside the league that have made a huge difference for them, but they've been able to identify players that are either in the wrong situation or maybe it's not going to work out the way that a team thinks, contract issues, whatever it is, that they're able to bring players in that can be effective. And then you look at an LAFC who have, it looks like a center forward that they believe is the last piece and they need some help bringing that player in. So I don't think there's a loser in this trade, and I love Mark Anthony K. And I love the idea that he goes to Colorado and it's his team. And no, he's not, you know, the Vela for them because they operate differently. But he knows that a lot of this is going to be built around him at 26, will be 27. Maybe there's a chance he goes to Europe, and I think that's part of this is what's the new contract look like if, if he does sign one with Colorado. But if he stays... And Cole Bassett's heading overseas and maybe Kellen Acosta is. This could be his team. And I love the idea of watching the game go through his feet consistently. So I think it's just a win-win on both sides. I think both fan bases should be really excited. I'm just going to list some names off just so people understand truly what the Rapids have done and the shift that they have made and the way that they use allocation money, basically like a big transfer fund for interleague trades here. So Keegan Rosenberry, Lalas Abubakar, Austin Trusty. Jonathan Lewis, Diego Rubio, uh, Barrios, Mesquita, Acosta, now Kay. I mean, throughout this entire, I mean, this is like the whole team. The whole team, yeah. <laughs> that they went out and did this on. I mean, this is, th- th- when you say there are different ways to do it. They did it with the manager, too. The- yeah, they did. <laughs> Good point. Good they, point. I mean, everyone was like, when, you, when is Frazier going to get a head coaching job? And you're like, oh, okay. They, they're going out and seeing the value. We'll give it to them. Yeah, they're seeing value in people that are maybe not getting the value or the shine. Now, K, I don't think falls into that category clearly. Uh, and you know, I, I think he, he, you know, they, you got a nice penny back for him. What was it like a million? Yeah, uh, mil. yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's that's it, it's more of a similar. The similarity is probably more of a Walker Zimmerman um, 
what the trade they made. But I think in this case, LAFC feels a little bit better about their center midfield situation with Cifuentes and, um, and K and Blessing. I'm sorry, K's gone. <laughs> Blessing. And it's yeah. uh, there. Well, they've and, been playing some wing backs too, where they just have two center midfielders, really. Right. It's been at Weston Blessing a lot. Yeah. So, so all of a sudden, saying, Sifu's further up the field. They have Janela sit in the back. They, they got the depth. Yeah. So that if you have the depth, then you start looking at, all right, that's can be value. And then you're like, who has the most value here? Where's the interest? And as long as K's, you know, it sounds like he's okay with this move too. And so, uh, and even if, you know, they don't make, if the Rapids don't make these trades, that also is exciting to, or don't sell players on, that also is exciting to me because then you start to see Acosta, who we saw, this tournament who's having a fantastic season. And then you go add him with K and you, you put those two together. I think K would probably be a little more deep lying. Maybe that frees Acosta up to go forward a little bit more and play a bit more of an attacking role than, than we're seeing him with the U S men's national team. But, um, or they could just alternate, you know, he could play a, a, you know, double pivot, dual six, whatever they want. Uh, there's a lot of different options they could do and then Bassett in front of them um, as well. So they, they've got a lot of really good options there. If, and I think it'd be pretty exciting, but it does sound like there probably is a move in the wings for one of these. Feels players. like there's a domino that's yeah. going to fall here. I'm happiest for Mark Anthony K. Get your money, man. Get your money. He was one of the best bargains in the league on performance versus compensation. That was that was a so, it was a hangup. We talk has about value. Players. We talk about value all all the time, and it's like look at the Canadian players. We talked about Alistair Johnson coming late in the, uh or he was being a draft pick but not like a top top draft pick and then i think uh tejan now we're like charlie's like eight million at the floor yeah, like yeah. He's, he's this man comes Bram- out of syracuse and he's just like Bramson. i'm just trying to be a pro here don't forget bat, 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 eight million yeah uh, but i mean like you go across mark anthony k was kind of just you know he was scouted at a Canada national team camp, I think by the goalkeeper coach, Zach Abdel for LAFC helped bring him to LAFC into the program. So uh, if you go around looking at for young Canadian players that there's, that's definitely um, some good value. Your people are teams are finding in MLS for a while now. Charlie, are you a believer in Austin FC now? Sebastian Drew sees in he's 25. Yeah. Center forward. They're announcing him as an attacking midfielder, but like at River Plate, he mostly played center forward. I know left wing with Zenit, but come on, he's a center forward for them. I don't know why they're saying yeah. attacking midfielder. I'm still baffled by that. Like mm-hmm. that's your center forward, guys. Just say it. Yeah. You have faith now? He might even make his debut for like two Copa de Tejas games. Now, now, when you're saying faith, what do you what do you mean? What, I don't know. You, you tell me what what kind of yeah. faith do you have now? What did you have before, and what do you have now? So I think Josh Wolf has done a fantastic job of of having putting together a team that can compete in the first season. Are they going to be are they going to be challenging for any trophies? No, they're not. But I do think they're a team that could upset and make and have some some surprise results towards the end of the season. So I wouldn't be surprised if they get in the playoffs. I would be surprised if they really went on a run to to try and win MLS Cup. I said this about um, Nashville with Ake Loba. Maybe that one didn't work out as well as this one in terms of this. But also, one of the things I was impressed with with Austin, with Austin was they built out that MLS group. You know, their big their big moves were, were Pochettino and, and Cecilio Dominguez, who I don't think have the ceiling of a Carlos Fella or anything like that. But that's talent that you can start to look for that last DP. And Alex Ring, I think, was the biggest acquisition they made coming into the season. But then... This is a player who went for $17 million to Zenit, right? So that's a huge transfer number that you're then trying to follow up with. But they kind of gave themselves, and obviously they've struggled the last few weeks, but they gave themselves time to let this work out. And rather than being forced into an early move or being forced into maybe the wrong player, they were able to let the team gel a little bit and be sure what they needed. And now you get to bring that player into an established environment. You bring them into a home game which they wouldn't have had and you know how tough it is for players from overseas to settle anyway. So I think they did a lot of this right. And if it hits the way they wanted to, and, and you know, it's tough for foreign players for it to hit a hundred percent year one, but if he can be that presence at center forward that they need score a couple of goals, I think a playoff run is a win for them. And they don't even have to make the playoffs. I think just to be competitive as the close of the season, have game mat, have games matter, have fans be excited about it. 
be have some buzz in the local press, all those things. I think that's a victory for them this year. And I think this is a team now that if Drew Reese comes in and he's fit and he's ready to play, that they have that capability. Win games at home. That's the only way they're going to get there. They got to win their home games. But this is a big sign. Well, look at them. the Seattle game. They played against teenagers. They I know. just couldn't score. Yeah, but everything you, about that game they should have won, but they couldn't score. Do you think they're going to challenge for MLS Cup? No. With, with no. the signing? I think they no. could challenge for the playoffs. Yeah. That's a win. Right. We're, all, we're all on the same page here. <laughs> so we're all picking Mexico? That's what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, big Friday night in MLS. Uh, two games on ESPN. Orlando City, Atlanta United, 8 p.m. Eastern. That's the first time I haven't said Orlando in reference to that rivalry when talking on this show. Uh, and then I did. I had to come back. <laughs> then LA Galaxy, Portland Timbers. No Chicharito. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to try to sell you a false bill of sale here. Uh, Javier is not going to play in this match. Greg Vanny didn't say it, but he did say it. He's like, ah, it's a little early. I don't think we'll risk him in this one. And that's a good thing. Keep him under wraps. We'll get to a signing that could help replace some of those minutes if Chicharito still has issues. But uh, on this Orlando City Atlanta one, Orlando, we know they're they're sort of ravaged right now. A lot of injuries, a lot of absences. But I was curious because the narrative used to be, and I'm a big part of this narrative, that Atlanta United and the father, Joseph Martinez, were utterly dominant over Orlando City. So I wanted to go back and see the last time Atlanta won in the regular season. It was August 2019. Frank DeBoer was the honorable manager of the Five Stripes, and James O'Connor was leading uh, the Lions with his safari hats and whatnot. Here is the lineup for Atlanta United in that game, and that'll tell you a lot about what has happened to the club and how much has changed. Joseph Martinez up top, boom. Barco, Pity Martinez behind. Barco's at the Olympics. He won't be available for this one. Pity, of course, sold, gone. Justin Miram, left wing back. Rometty, Nagby in the midfield, all of them gone. Justin, uh, Julian Gressel, right back, gone. Florentine Pogba, gone. Miles Robinson, he's there but won't be available. Uh, LGP, gone. Brad Guzan, he's in the team but won't be available. So you have one player from that entire 11 who will be available. And the subs, Tito Vialba. Jeff Lorenowitz and Emerson Heineman, none of them available. So in this match, not even two years later, one man, Joseph Martinez, is the lone thread. That's the only thread that extends. And did the you fates go, of did both you go through clubs the Orlando have completely lineup? changed. <laughs> uh, I did. That was a lot different, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that was, but Orlando were bad then, Kalen, so it's a okay, good thing right. that they're completely different now. All right, all right, yeah. Where does right, this rivalry right, right. stand at this point? And I know this is not a like we're all full we're all full strength like you know decision day playoff style battle here. Like what what's the state of the rivalry in in uh, in the South? I mean, I think Atlanta is playing against themselves in a lot of ways right now. Like I, I think that they're at in a position where they're not. They're, they'll use the rivalry game maybe as some extra motivation to get up, but I, I think the real. Um, the real battle has been to try and find their form and try and find their, their own form. And which, you know, the, I think the last couple games you've seen maybe a, a little bit of a different style where they're trying to be a little bit more attacking minded. And, and I think sometimes even when you just get a new coach, a fresh, fresh face uh, come in, get some positivity back into the team. Cause it sounds like things have gotten really bad there. Right. So um, I don't know how much it'll be about, the rivalry so much in this game than just trying to find their own footing and get things back on track. Shout out to Rob Valentino, who's who is the interim head coach, my former teammate back in the day, but he was also an Orlando City player. Hold on, hold on, former teammate. Player. Which, Can we which, I guess which we're, Rob we're adding. You know, is this, is this a, a Westchester player? Flames teammate? Yeah. No. New Hampshire team. National team. Yeah, youth national team. Okay. Did he play? Yeah. At, he played at San Francisco. Yeah, with Brendan McDonald, BMAC. Dude, I played against. Okay, I played against. Whoa, them. we got all the threads coming now. Oh, watch and, out, Bay Area. And, East and Bay. it goes back. It goes back to we were playing against each other in club at the uh, Disney tournament where he's playing on the Serena Golden Eagles, and it was Robbie Finley, Brendan McDonald, ah. and him. And you know the Boston. I was playing on the Boston uh, Bolts, and we beat them. Um, to, to win the tournament, but the uh, what is happening uh, right now? Hey, all I need, all I need. Uh, can I just say that was in Golden Orlando Eagles versus the Bolts? That's like a the classic, Serena like, Golden like Eagles YMCA yeah. matchup right there. You guys are wearing like, hey, you know, like the burgundy and gold. Don't disrespect the club. Sorry, the, AYSL, the my club bad. YMCA days. is just a little bit earlier, man. But hey, I think he's come into it with, you know, that 
I think the the perspective of I want this to be fun. Let's get back to enjoying the game, enjoying each other, because it's been dysfunctional for far too long. And he's seen it. He's been he's been what with two of these these coaches, where it, it's just gone completely the other way. And I think for him, it's let's just get back to having some fun. I'm not trying to make this strict. You know, you hear some of the horror stories that are coming out of Atlanta. They go everybody, from everybody gets the best. Fired, Charlie. They go from the best hydration to breaks. rock bottom. Rock bottom. Galaxy Timbers, Tim BM Eastern. Dave, I'll just throw this to you. It's like what? It is almost 2 a.m. your guys' time, so we're going to finish after this one. Who is going to be more impactful? I'm on the West Coast, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah you're good to go. Switch oh, it up. Oh, good. More yeah, impactful. 42 a.m. here. U22 signing. <laughs> the Timbers signing signing of Moreno. Second forward winger. Or the Galaxy reportedly signing uh, Serbia and Eintracht Frankfurt forward, Dan Jovelic. Yeah, I think Jovelic. Be- <laughs> I think Jovelic, though, because he is, a, he is a natural second forward alongside Chicha. And when you look at the way Vanny wants to play, you put Cabral and Grand, Grand Seer out wide, they're able to create chances. We've seen how dangerous Chicharito has been. I, I think he leads the league in XG and goals. So, like, the chances have been there. Now add a second runner in there a guy pulling other center backs back. If Cheech is making that hard near post run, someone there for the pullback, someone ghosting on the far post, it seems like a natural fit and it should be exciting for Galaxy fans that maybe also a succession plan in place as Chicharito gets a little bit older, but it seems like it all fits. Now for Portland, I love the idea of bringing in some youth, some energy into that attack to, to make life a little bit easier for Valeri and a Blanco or make you less reliant on them. But for the Galaxy, I think this is actually going to be a really good setup for them. And again, this is Greg Vanny's guy, right? Greg Vanny has had a hand in all these signings. He has an idea of how it's all going to fit into the way he wants his team to play. And it's worked so far. Also, Chicharito is going to be out right now. They don't have that succession plan right now. Like it's Ethan Zubak or it's false nine Victor, Victor Vasquez, and it's not working. So that that's a big signing for them. We'll see how well he does. It's not uh, done yet, though. I think it's reported, but it seems like it's going to be done. Fabrizio Romano is the one reporting it at this point. Let's get the mailbag and get the hell out of here. 401206. <laughs> Extra time at MLSsoccer.com. Give us the best of the best, Dave. What do you got? Ooh, 2 a.m. You want a good mailbag question? CM here who says, what does it say about your team, a.k.a. the San Jose Earth- Earthquakes, when their best player – has been the same guy for over a decade in Shea Salinas. And they've had Giovanni, Jallo, Dawkins, Mgara, and now Andy Rios as their high played, high paid players. Does anyone want to do a little San Jose love right now? Lately? Uh, Wando slander will not be stood for, but the Shea Salinas praise will absolutely be appreciated and celebrated. But yeah, it's tough times. I don't know if you guys saw, but San Jose are looking for a new, uh, a new sporting leader. <laughs> to replace Jesse Fiorinelli, and they're looking for someone with MLS experience. But I thought that uh, I thought the is same that a new title, like, sporting leader. Nah, <laughs> they don't. I don't know what it's going to be. You know, it's like is it going to okay. be sporting director? Is it going to be technical director? Is it going to be GM? Like, there's they all need, these different they, titles, and we yeah. don't know who it's going to be. They need a lot of help. They, they do need a lot of help. help. They just need a plan. Like, what do you want to be? You're not going to spend the same amount of money as like Galaxy, Inter Miami, Atlanta United, and uh, honestly, the Portland Timbers. So, what are you going to be? How are you going to be competitive? I don't know that they have that plan. Most of the teams that are down there batting at a different level as far as expenditures have that plan. At least the successful ones do. I know I know a good person for that position. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah. Aguchi and Yewu. You're going to make the case? I mean, so, well, I love Gooch. I just thought you were going to. This is the reason why. Because if you're not going to spend money, you need to have someone who can speak many different languages, who has access to European players who won't cost that much money and has great connections, which he does. And he's had the experience. He's played in MLS and he's played in Europe and he's played on the national team and he's a young up-and-coming person who, why wouldn't you give him the chance? I appreciate that. I'm gonna Chuck, just just doesn't, Chuck just doesn't, doesn't want to share the broadcast booth with you anymore. He's exactly. Like, <laughs> he's like, hmm. Clint Dempsey, look at Clint. Uh, yeah, who else is moving on? It's like, who just taking too much of my airtime yeah. last week? Yeah. <laughs> Kate Abdo, if you want to. Get I, I'm, I'm going to put my money on Chris Lee. I'm, I'm down if Gooch goes out and finds some uh, some young Berkeley ballers. I can. I can hey, no, not, seriously. We're, I, we're, I, think, I think everyone's sick of seeing the same names for these same positions, to be honest. So I, I think I it's, that. 
it's time for a change. Like get some some new names, some fresh blood in, in, into the system. I'm gonna throw Chris Leach out there, who kind of had this position and was the head coach and has moved back up, but knows the club. Uh, that may be something about San Jose and the ambition side of those things. I think Chris would do a great job. And then Todd Donovan's out there too. Uh, and things in Sacramento have changed a little bit. So that's just a couple of names in Northern I didn't California. Think that was the name you were going to say. You normally bring up Will Koontz's name every other day. Yeah, well, now the one he's actually Will, linked yeah, to. Yeah, Will Koontz is a pretty obvious one here as well. They they keep talking about analytics, so that's something to put uh, to put around this one. Anything else? Are we out of here, man. No, I just would throw my name in there too. Like I know MLS I'm Empire sure. guys. You're close by, sure. right? You're on the West Coast. Yeah, so right. You you guys guys. I just went to Latak. <laughs> Let's talk in the mission, baby. I, yeah. I can hang out here. So just give me a give me a call, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Empire, Empire Gas for sure. Yeah, yeah. a little bit, a little bit <laughs> different. He's, in too East Coast. He's too East Coast, man. He is East Coast. That's maybe that's what they need—a little more speed, a little more aggression <laughs> to everything they do, not this laid back stuff. God. All right, we're gonna call this good. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you're listening live, if it's on demand, or you're listening to the podcast. Same thing. Subscribe, rate, help us out, spread the word. Uh, we will be back. On Monday and Sunday. Sunday is the reaction to the final. That's coming quickly. It's in like two days. It's like 72 hours, and we're right back here to do the same thing. And then Monday, we will wrap up week 16, all the coverage, MLSsoccer.com, and the MLS app. Enjoy your night, your day, your morning, whatever it is. We'll see you on Sunday night, everybody.